Hey, everybody. My name is TJ Roy. Welcome to uh, Orvis Day's live session. Um, regional manager with Orvis, um, standing in for the great Tom Rosenbauer tonight. Uh, and we're here to talk about Eastern Tailwaters. Uh, I'm joined by my friend, Brown Hobson, owner and operator of Brown Trout Fly Fishing, uh, based in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, 2014 Fly Fishing Team USA selection. Um, and 2015 Orvis Norris Guide of the Year. Uh, his home is uh, filled with leather-bound books and smells like rich mahogany. Hey, Brian, how you doing, buddy? I'm great, TJ. Thanks, man. Awesome, awesome. Um, so uh, really excited to have you on tonight. Um, really excited about this discussion. Uh, Eastern tailwaters are, are great fisheries. Um, you know, certainly important to your line of work. Uh, so before we get into tonight's topic, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, background on yourself, Brown, and, and how you got into to guiding? Yeah, so um, it was an accident. Um, I kind of backed into it. Um, I uh, wanted to be a professional bass fisherman growing up. Grew up in South Carolina. Um, did not have a bass boat, so that was a major hurdle. And I fished a little bit in high school. Um, you know, maybe I get lucky and catch a fish or two. Maybe I didn't. Um, and got more serious about it in college. And a buddy was working for Worldcast Anglers. Invited me to come out, help me get a job at the Orvis store in Jackson Hole. And I went out there and I fished seven days a week and soaked up as much knowledge as I could. And uh, I did finish college, um, but I did not. I was studying geology and wanted to work in the oil fields. And after spending a summer fishing and working at Orvis, I decided that was not for me. And so I uh, did graduate, went back to Jackson, worked at Orvis, worked as a fish manager uh, where we met, um, worked as a store manager. And uh, when it was time to leave Jackson and move back east, um, I decided it was time to start guiding. And, uh, you know, or Orvis gave me a great background to, to start building on and, um, you know, came back here and started rowing people down the river. Cool, cool. Yeah, spent a few holiday seasons in that Orvis, Orvis Charlotte store, too. That was a, yep. a good time. Awesome yeah. time. So, Thank you. Uh, great story, man. Um, so, uh, so let's talk a little bit uh, about tonight's topic, Eastern Tailwaters. Um, you know, why we, while we are talking about tailwaters in the east, um, you know, it, it's, it's really important to recognize that, that tailwaters uh, produce prolific trout streams uh, all over the country, all over the world. Um, you know, but for those of us in the southeast, uh, uh, tailwaters are, are a huge trout resource for us. Um, you know, without them, uh, you know, our access to viable trout water would be, would be much more limited. Um, so so let, let's start with the basics here. Uh, Brown, what what is a tailwater? You know, how does it differ from, say, a freestone, you know, or a spring creek? Yeah, so basically, you know, uh, a tailwater is a river that is fed um, from the bottom of a dam. Um, a freestone is just a you know a, a mountain stream that you know uh, stones can roll down freely without hitting any impediments. Um, you know, all the creeks and things around Pisgah National Forest. Um, uh, and then a spring creek is a spring fred stream. They're typically in flat areas. Uh, they're slow moving. Freestones are very fast. Um, and the tailwaters can be either. I mean, they can they can have a lot of vertical drop or they can be flat. Um, and uh, uh, but they always come from a dam. And that that keeps them really cold. You know, that's that's the big um, the benefit to us here in the South. You know, our trout you know almost die every summer in North Carolina and Georgia and, and Tennessee. Um, it gets really hot. Some years they do die. We've some, had some big die-offs since I've been here, but not on the tailwaters. You know, the water, you know, coming out of a tailwater maybe 48 degrees in January, March, June, July, August. Like, it doesn't matter. If you get close enough to the dam, it will be the exact same uh, almost every day. I mean, some of the lake turnover things can, can affect that a little bit, but it's pretty much the same. I mean, we're talking South Wilson Lakes are, are, are you know, well over 100 feet deep, um, and, and that bottom layer stays, stays nice and cold all the time. So it's the depth of the lake and the water coming out from the bottom of the dam that keeps it cold. 365, 24-7. Right. Gotcha. Cool. And, and in this area, you know, the TVA, um, you know, as part of the New Deal, it was one of the biggest hydroelectric projects, um, you know, in the country that's ever happened. Um, you know, the byproduct of it was this creation of just tons of great trout habitat. Um, and, and, you know, we get to reap the benefits of that. Um, well, so many famous tailwaters are, are known for holding 
really high fish counts, you know, lots of fish per mile, uh, sort of off the charts, um, and along with really, really big fish as well. You know, what, what conditions are present in tailwaters uh, that produce, you know, such exceptional numbers of fish and size of fish? So, you know, here in North Carolina, in North Carolina, East Tennessee, um, you know, well, there are a couple things going on on the East Tennessee tailwaters, um, but we'll talk about the cold water first. Um, you know, or, or what I assume is cold. For some reason, the, the biomass of bugs in tailwaters is just significantly greater. Um, it, it may be the access to cold water year round. Um, it may be the, you know, the, the more constant or, or, you know, flows. Um, but you just get more bugs. If you come to North Carolina and start flipping rocks, you're going to see, you know, some bugs on each rock. If you flip, grab a hunk of moss out of one of our tailwaters or, or flip a rock over there, it's going to be covered in bugs. So there's just a lot more food. Um, you know, it also stays a lot colder. So that's one of the reasons in the southeast we can get larger fish. You know, if you're a fish over 13 inches living in a freestone in the Smoky Mountains, it gets really hard to live in August. You know, I, I always tell people it's like an offensive lineman going to football camp in August. They start running around when it's 75 degrees, 80 degrees outside. They have a lot of trouble. Um, you know, when you see heat strokes happening, that's, you know, those are the guys that have trouble when it's really, really hot out. Um, same for the big trout. You know, the small trout, and that's the reason why a lot of our little creeks have small trout. They can get all the resources they need because they don't need that much. Um, the tailwaters don't have nearly the limitations when it comes to dissolved oxygen um, because the water's colder and, and those big fish can you know, stay much healthier all summer long. Um, what's really unique about the tailwaters we have in East Tennessee, and, and we're going to talk mostly about the Watauga and South Olson, but there are lots of others. You know, the Hiawassee is a great one um, a little bit further south. Um, they also, uh, the tailwaters flow through limestone bedrock. And, and that neutralizes uh, the pH of the water a little bit. You know, limestone's kind of a basic rock. You know, you kind of people lime their yards um, to, to keep it from being too acidic. And, and the bugs love that. Um, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of great spring creeks that have limestone. Any stream that has limestone is going to be good. We have the ultimate combination, limestone and the cold water year-round. And the bugs just go crazy. And it's um, you get decent diversity of bugs, but you just get mega mega amounts of single insect population. I mean, anybody that's been to the South Holston or Watauga, the South Holston seen a sulfur hatch or the Watauga and see the mothers and caddis hatch. I mean, it's just unreal how many bugs there are. Um, and, you know, even when they're not hatching, the, the fish have access to those nymphs. And, um, so it, it can support lots and lots of fish. I mean, ridiculous fish densities. And, you know, the brown trout especially get really big in these environments. Yeah, yeah, kind of the perfect storm. Got a question here around, um, you know, does that plentiful biomass make trout fussier to imitations? Really, really ties in nicely to that. I mean, tailwaters have earned a reputation for being really challenging, really te technical fisheries. Is that is that a fair assessment? For sure. There can be too many bugs, um, especially in a hatch situation. You know, I don't run into that as often. Well, I'll say there's two things. So, so one, in a hat dry fly scenario, when you've got fish rising, there can be absolutely way too many bugs for the fish to find yours. Um, and, and in that case, I don't know that they're exactly fussy. They just can't find yours. I mean, you know, sulfurs are yellow mayflies. And, you know, I, I know a lot of times we have to fish blue and olives um, during the sulfur hatch to try to make our bugs stand out. Um, you know, sometimes people fish pink ones instead of yellow ones. Or, you know, you got to – sometimes you got to put something on that's different. Uh, to get some attention just because there's so many bugs on the water. The other interesting thing is because there's so many nymphs in the water, and uh, we're going to talk about our generations, but our water flows can go up and down, you know, several feet during a day, during the day. And, and if the fish don't like a certain flow for some reason, let's say, you know, and we're going to speculate about trout mentality, but they're in a bad mood when the water comes up because they were happy with it down, they might not eat for three or four hours. Um, and especially if we have a pattern, right? If it comes on, at, the water comes on at eight every day and off at noon every day, those fish will get conditioned. They'll know the water's going to drop at, say, you know, they'll drop out at three o'clock at any, a certain spot on the river. And they'll just hold off until the water drops. And as soon as it drops, they'll feed like crazy. So, you know, it, it, sometimes you just got to wait for them to eat. When they have that much food, they can eat a day's worth of food in just a few hours. Yeah, yeah. From an angler's perspective, it can kind of be 
feast or famine and they can turn on and, and turn off just as fast. Right. I hear that. Definitely been there before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so before we get into tactics, um, you know, no overview of a tailwater would be complete uh, without discussing safety because, you know, these rivers, again, are they're, they're man-made um, and those generations can rise and fall without warning. So if, if you're new to tailwater fishing or maybe uh, new to fish or, or, or fishing a new tailwater for the first time, you know, what, what advice would you give someone, you know, going out there, especially the weight angler? So, um, you know, you got to know what the dam is releasing that day. Um, and you got to hope they stick to that schedule. And the TVA for the last month has not been sticking to the published schedule. They've had, you know, some, some repairs they're making to generators on Watauga Dam. And, and they oftentimes have to run water when they say they're not or they don't when they say they're going to do it. And so, you know, I know TJ there was a big Orvis float and they cut the water off early and it stranded everybody. Uh, everybody's I out until nine yeah, I remember that. their boats <laughs> off the water. Um, it happened to be really that, cold. That's not that as dangerous as it coming up unexpectedly. I was actually in college, I was on the Hiawassee River and I didn't know anything about tailwaters. I was fishing, wasn't catching fish. All of a sudden, fish are rising. I started to call three or four fish real fast. I was feeling great, super excited. And all of a sudden, as I'm trying to fly, and I sort of look around, and I realize the water's coming. And the water on the Hiawassee comes up really fast. And I was fairly close to the house. I looked up to him. I could see a wall of water coming at me. And I couldn't get back to the side of the river where my car was. I had to run to the other side of the river, get out before I got swept downstream. And then I had to walk like a mile back up river to a bridge to get back across to walk a mile back down river to get to my car. Um, you know, so it can be very dangerous. You need to know what's happening. Um with the schedule and always keep your head on a swivel. You know, if the fish aren't biting and they start, it might be because the water's coming. If they really enjoy that first little push of water and they'll start to feed real fast. So that can be a giveaway. Um, sometimes, hey, I should check and see. Um, but not all tailwaters are like that. You know, ours down here in the southeast are. You know, the South Fork of the Snake, which is out west, um, you know, dropped like one thirty second of an inch every day because it had a lot of stream uh, snow melt coming into it as well. And I can remember every fall they'd drop the rotter a little bit and they'd drop it 500 CFS and it would like trash the fishing um, for a day or two. And, and here it comes up 2000 CFS sometimes every couple hours and our fish handle it much better because they're used to it. Um, but, it, but basically we have low water on our tailwaters and the water's easy to wade, very manageable, you know, easy to fish. And when the water comes on, when they generate power, the water comes up two feet. Um, and, and it, you know, goes up by sometimes a factor of 10 in volume. It goes from a 250 CFS release to over 2,500 CFS. Uh, so get the TVA app. Um, if you've got a different power generation, you get them. hopefully they have an app. You've got numbers you can call. Um, just know what's going on and know that even if they say they're not going to run water, they might. Um, yeah, yeah. And no matter where you are, that that power company is going gonna, is gonna to post a schedule of generation. So yeah know how to find that um, and, uh, and, and definitely be safe waiting out there. And, and, you know, if you're, you know, it's, it's always worth stopping into your local fly shop, uh, your local Orvis store um, when you're, when you're trying to trying out a new fishery or getting into tailwater fishing and talk to some, some people that have done it, you know, um, some, some of these tailwaters, you know, they got a big horn that goes off when that generation starts and some don't. So be safe out there. Yeah, and it can be tricky to read the the generation schedule sometimes. So if you don't know for sure, call your local orb store, and um, all all the guys around the fisheries here know you know how to read them and can help you. Yep, yep, great advice there. Um, so let's get back to that prolific bug bug life common on tailwaters. Um, you know what's what's your approach when it's going off? We talked a little bit about that. Um, and then what do you do when there might not be as many clues out there as to what the fish are eating? Yeah, so, you know, we have, um, we don't have an incredibly diverse population of bugs on, on the Watauga and South Olsen. We have a lot, um, but we have a huge amount of certain bugs. We have a ton of midges, um, we have sulfurs, uh, which is a mayfly, and we have blue dollars, which is a mayfly. And we also have, especially on the Watauga and on the South Olsen too, um, a good number of caddisflies, um. You know, they, the fish in our rivers are eating midges um, and betas nymphs almost every day. You know, blue-winged olive nymphs, betas nymphs, um, 
Texas. I mean, they, they, those those food sources are readily available. Um, and outside of like a seasonal time of year, like right now, the you know the fish are seeing a lot of sulfur nymphs crawling around. Um, they've been seeing a lot of caddis pupa around. Outside of that time of year, I mean, everybody kind of relies on on blue wings and midges, um, and lots of midges uh, and, and all colors and sizes. Um, you know, typically the bugs are bigger earlier in the year and smaller as they go on. You know, if you can imagine if the sulfurs hatch in April and May, they lay eggs. The, you know, small sulfur nymphs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as the year goes on and are their biggest kind of in March. Um, you know, late summer, early fall, the bugs are teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, same with the, the spring blue wings. Um, so if you're unsure, you know, uh, a small mayfly nymph and a midge are a great way to start, place to start. Um, you know, if you pump fish's stomachs, you're going to see those in their samples every day. Um, and, and then start looking around for bugs that are maybe flying around. You know, a caddis flying around is a good indication you might try a caddis pupa. Um, you know, you don't see the caddis pupa, obviously, because they're underwater. But if you see some caddis flying around, they've got to be pupa. Um, and then just general attractors. You know, everybody fishes, um, you know, big attractor flies, whether it's like a big prince nymph or a stonefly nymph or a worm or an egg or a mop, you know, um, there are a lot of days they'll, the fish will run from stuff like that. You know, if it's too gaudy, they'll, instead of looking at your back fly, they may run from your back fly, but, um, you know, if nothing's going on, a nymph, a nymph rig is a great way place to start, you know? Yeah. When it's, you know, we use, uh, thingamabobbers typically on high water or, or airlocks or something like that. And, and then we use a lot of yarn on low water. You know, our water, when it's low, it can be slow in places and the fish are spooky and, um, you know, yarn indicators are, are really effective tools. They don't make noise. They're a little harder mm -hmm. to cast, but, you know, they don't make noise and, and they show really light bites, which you can get when the water's moving slowly. Sure, sure. And and uh, and you kind of short leash them too, you know, catch those fish that are feeding in the film, you know. Um, cool. Uh, so granted, this is going to vary by fishery, but... Uh, any thoughts on bugs that, that are sort of always in your fly box? You know, I fish a lot of pheasant tails, different types of pheasant tails. Um, you know, it's a popular fly. I've been fishing. I've had pheasant tails in my box since day one. My first box had like a worm, a prince nymph, a copper john, and a pheasant tail. Um, and they just work. They're great flies. And you can church them up, church them down, beads, no beads wire no wire flashback no flashback there are all these different variations of, i've probably got i've got two boxes of, of just feather tails in all different shapes sizes colors and, and variations um you know uh zebra midges are awesome you know that's a, a great midge pattern comes in a lot of colors red olive gray black brown um you know different bead colors you know bead color matters a lot on our rivers um hmm. you know copper silver gold and black they all have their place, and you can have the same fly with a uh, silver bead on it, and they're not eating it, and you switch to a copper bead, and bam, you know, they're smashing it, or any other combination of those. Um, gotcha. Yeah. You know, and I, cool. uh, I love stonefly nymphs. Um, that's a great, like, man, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to put on a stonefly nymph and put something behind it and pray that something will tackle the stonefly nymph. It is a big offering. <laughs> Uh, and they will eventually if you fish it long enough. Uh, it'll help yeah, get you through yeah. some slow times. <laughs> um, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you know, back to that question about about um, you know what happens when you find yourself out there in in the midst of birds, olives. Um, you know, how do you how do you uh, approach that? How do you get the fish to find your fly? Um, you know. Have, upsize or or you know look for for gaps in the naturals like what what's your approach what do you tell your clients to do in that situation so you know you're kind of going into like a very uh, uh you know the hardest scenario that we run into which luckily doesn't happen all that often you know usually they're willing and, and the most important thing is presentation um you know the fish um the fish around here really want to see the fly first like you can't throw from below them you got to get beside them or even above them a little bit you've got to cast in if you can reach cast that's super helpful um if you can't reach cast you got to get it in get a big mend on it so that the fly comes first there can't be even a little bit of leader like even a couple inches of leader dragging down river as it comes into the fish's face will turn them off and they won't eat it all you'll see them kind of come up and go right back down 
Um, so get the whole leader upstream, get the fly to them first. And, you know, when you're around here, sometimes you can see hundreds of fish rising within range at one time. You got to pick one fish and you got to stick with it. And that's really difficult because there's so many targets. You got to pick that one fish, make that good cast, get your big men, give it the fly first. And you want to land three, four feet above them, let it get three, four feet below them, pick it up and put it right back in there. And don't leave that fish until it eats. Because if you watch them, our fish might only eat once every like, you know, minute or two. They don't eat every you know 10 or 15 seconds. Um, and if you get distracted and leave, your fly won't be in the strike zone when that fish feeds next. So hunker down, pick that one fish out, you know, cast until you catch it. Um, or, and eventually you've got to say, hey, this one's not a happy fish. I'm going to move on to another one. But you can't just throw it wildly all over the place and expect to have any success. It's got to be right on them, the good men. Um, and if they're not eating the best flies, I mean, you know, we fish a lot of comparadons here. It's not a secret. I'm not giving it away. If you go into any fly shop, you have millions of comparadons. If they want to the comparadon, things can get much trickier. Um, and you just start going through your box, trying different stuff. Like you said, you can go bigger. You can change colors. You know, I keep blue wing olives in the same size range as the sulfurs, which are a little bit big for blue wings. But, um, you know, that's something that's different. Uh, I actually ran into that really picky scenario on the South Pole since Saturday. Um, the bugs came off and there were fish rising everywhere. And I went through almost every sulfur I had, emergers, spinners, duns. You can see duns everywhere. I mean, there were duns on the water. Um, but the fish were focused on some kind of emerger. There was some phase of their life cycle that was they were being super picky about. I could we couldn't figure it out. I mean, it was I was sitting there like la sort of laughing, sort of crying. I mean, <laughs> if you've ever been around hundreds of fish rising, you can't catch. It's awful. It's embarrassing when you're the person that's supposed to know how to catch fish. Um, you know what? I, what we noticed was their noses were not coming out of the water. Right, like they were their their backs were coming out. They're eating something right below um, the, the surface, and, and we didn't get it figured out. But luckily, after about thirty minutes. I saw a fish's nose come out of the water, and I was like, something's changed. I don't know what changed, but they're cha the fish are doing something different. My, my client threw right at the fish, ate it on the first cast, and from then on for the next hour, we got eats as fast as we could get them frogs fanned off and put back in front of the fish. Like, So, you know, it, you got to notice, like, are their lips up or are they underwater? I mean, if their lips are up, then stick with the dons. If not, even if you're unsuccessful, you got to try something in that emerger game. Sometimes you got to twitch the flies a little bit. I mean, you got to get creative. And um, sometimes, like I did, you just got to wait them out and hope they change. Yeah, yeah. No, I've I've been in that situation many times before. It is, it's a killer. <laughs> um, and I, I think you brought up a really good point too. Um, you know, letting that fly pass the fish by a, by a pretty good distance before you make that pickup, and really making a soft pickup with that fly line too. I mean, I I've, I've had a lot of you know, I had that situation occur before where, you know, you're getting frustrated. You want to get that next cast in, but you, you maybe don't let that line pass the fish by far enough. You maybe pick it up a little bit too fast. Anything that disturbs the water can, can really shut them down. So I, mm -hmm. I thought that was a good tip there too. And I do, um, you know, I fish, I'll fish two dry flies if I'm prospecting for trout, you know, if I'm not focused on one fish, but if you've got one fish that you're looking for, you're, you're casting to one riser, one fly is the way to go. Don't go two flies. It's too much tippet. You know, you, you can do it successfully, but the, the second fly is going to have tippet on both sides and, and the fish are going to see it. So just stick with one fly. Yeah. And a, an important note about tailwaters generally too, as opposed to freestones, you know, that, that water's, you know, the, the fish are, are going to, like you say, inspect those flies more closely. So everything has to be done just a little bit slower a little bit more methodical. Um, cool. Uh, let's talk about uh, gear. You know, what what rods are, are always in your boat? What's a good tailwater rod? You know, nine foot four weights and nine foot five weights. Um, they're perfect. You know, the, the four weights can be a little small if, if it gets windy or if you're having to throw something that's really big. Um, I love them for dry flies. Um, and, and they nymph and do all those stuff well. But, but for nymph rods and, and dry dropper rods, I love them. I love five weights. So if you're throwing a, something big like a grasshopper to float a, a nymph, um, five weights perfect. Um, you know, I typically will run um, 
I mean, I, I, always floating line, except for seeing, seeing the streamers, but we'll come to that in a second. Um, you know, always floating lines. Uh, I typically run um, a big leader on my draw dropper rods, you know, something that'll handle a big grasshopper type fly or a big caddis. Um, turn it over and I say a 3 or 2x. Um, if the fish are going to eat a big fly like a 12 alpha caddis, they don't care what the tippet looks like. You know, they're, they're coming for a big meal. Um, you know, nymph rigs, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, seven and a half foot leaders are great for that because you don't want a whole lot of butt section or the tapered part in the middle to be in the water, right? You want to get your indicator down at the end of the thick butt section so that everything going down is thin diameter and sinks really well. Uh, I, I love starting with seven and a half foot four X, um, leaders uh, for my nymph rods. Um, and that might be a little counterintuitive too, you know. I, I think people tend to think tailwaters got to be hyper technical with the presentation, super long leaders, but seven and a half foot four x on a nymph rig. That's 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 a yeah. good tip. But conversely, if I'm fishing a dry in a hatch, I'm probably running like a twelve foot five x or twelve foot six x leader. You know, that's a different story. Um, mm -hmm. But nymph rig, yeah, the fish aren't close to the surface. You don't have to worry about that. You just want something that'll deliver. A, you know, a junky rig and uh, without tangling and get it down. Gotcha. Cool. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the different fish species that you encounter on, on the tailwaters you fish, you know, how do the tactics change if, if you're say targeting rainbows versus browns? I mean, it, talk a little bit about how, how they feed differently. Um, and, and you know, how you adjust. Yeah. So, um, rainbows feed a lot. You know, that's why people like them. I mean, they, they evolved in a, you know, uh, area of the country that was in the Pacific Northwest, lots of food, high flows. Um, and, and for whatever reason, they just, they don't mind getting in fast water, but when they're in fast water, they've got to eat a lot. Um, so they are more often feeding than the brown trout just because that's their nature. They'll spend more energy to get more food. You know, the brown trout you often find in, in the slower water, not that we caught one in a rapid today, but, you know, typically they'll be in a little bit slower water, and I think they're more efficient type fish. You know, they don't want to waste a whole bunch of energy sitting at the head of a run um, feeding as often. Um, so th that's kind of the main difference how they feed. Our fish, because the tail, the flows are up and down all the time, are hard to predict. You know, today, this morning, we caught almost all brown trout, which is really strange because a couple of days ago, we could not buy brown trout on the same stretch of river. Um, they do feed in, you know, in, in different um, uh, population groups, and they can also feed at the same time. Some days, rainbow, brown, rainbow, brown, rainbow, brown, back and forth. Um, but, you know, don't be shocked if you're up here and it's all one or all the other. And, you know, both of them have a big population of, of wild brown trout. Um, both of them have a good population of wild rainbows and both of them get a lot of stocked rainbows too. Um, so those are three different fish, you know, the, the wild rainbows and the stocked rainbows don't feed the same. They don't hold in the same water. Um, so, you know, we, we've got three different fish and we've also got some, we got some sucker fish. We've got a great big sucker fish yesterday. It's like a five pin, five pound half high fin carp sucker. Thought it was a brown trout for like two minutes. Um, <laughs> it was still an awesome fish, but it wasn't a brown sure. trout. Um, <laughs> And, you know, occasionally we do the, the TBA or TWRA stocks, lake trout, um, you know, the, the, the Mackinac lake trout, not like just a, not a trout in a lake, but the actual lake trout, um, the char species in the lakes above our rivers. And um, they somehow get sucked, they get sucked through turbines. I mean, I've only caught a few, um, but most people I know have at least caught one or two over the years in the Watauga and South Holston River. So you might encounter those. Um, they're a very small population, but they are in there. Um, no brook trout. You know, a lot of our, our wade ships have told we don't have any brook trout in the tailwaters. Um, I, I but other really, that. other other really cool uh, bycatch or other species in these tailwaters in the southeast, especially that get really big. I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. Some stripers, right? <laughs> um, so so there's sort of a love this love hate relationship with stripers uh, among the guide community in in the Watauga. Talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, so they, they run up the um, South Holston a little bit, you know, the first couple holes, um, and, and then mostly stop. The Watauga, they get thick in, and they'll run almost halfway up. Um, 
and they do get big. I mean, you know, the average fish, you know, that we catch are like, I don't know, 20 to 35 pounds. Um, but some pushing, <laughs> some pushing 40 pounds. They're big striped bass. Um, That's nuts. Yeah. You, you, we never, nobody ever catches a lot of them. You know, it's not like going to one of these mega fisheries, like, you know, the Roanoke river where you can catch a hundred in a day, you know, you're going to catch maybe a few if you're lucky in a day, but they're going to be big ones. Um, and they eat a lot of trout. Um, I, uh, I, I eat striper and when you clean the striped <laughs> bass, if you look in their stomach, like I always do, um, there'll be three or four trout skeletons in every one. And, uh, they live in Boone Lake. They run up in the summer they follow the shad, you know, late May, early June, the shad migrate and spawn. And, um, and once they get in and see the trout, they hang out and, and they sit and they eat and they eat. And you can tell the trout fishing in May on the areas where the stripers are changes dramatically um, once they get there in the summertime. You know, you can catch them all over the pool in the spring. As soon as stripers get there, you only catch them in the riffle and you only catch them in the tail. They are gone uh, from the middle parts of the pool because the stripers just work on them. So they're fun to catch, but, uh, you know, we're always hoping they, they won't come next year. And they just filled Boone Lake after having Boone Lake be you know, almost empty for a long time. And we're hoping maybe they'll stay this year. We'll see. Um, but if not, we'll keep catching stripers here and there, and it'll be fun. Yeah, some, something that pulls hard. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of striper fishing on the fly, that sort of leads into, into streamer fishing, um, which, which can be very productive uh, on tailwaters. So, um, you know, what's your what's your approach to streamer fishing on tailwaters you know what what are the what conditions need to be present for for that to work um man so as you know um from your streamer <laughs> fishing uh it can be good and it can also be terrible um <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be committed man <laughs> you gotta be committed you gotta you gotta do it all day and sometimes multiple days uh so you know our fish have a lot of food and when the water's down and, and super low, the streamer game is probably not going to work. You know, you definitely, definitely need high water. They need to be generating power. Um, and even better than that, um, if the water can be a little off color and muddy, you know, those two combos are great. If it can be high, not chocolate milk, but just off color and high is great. You know, the high water pushes fish to the banks, pushes them to the mid river gravel bars, bridge columns, you know, any kind of structure. Um, and, and it forces them out of the you know middle where you you know just you make them blind guesses. Um, allows you to target spots they'll be in. And when the water's high and off color, the fish can't see that the streamer's not real. In low water, you can throw streamers and get fish to follow, but they can see the feathers, they can see the rubber legs, they can see that this is not real. Uh, high water, they just get boom. You know, they drop your streamer off of a stump. You know, they get shocked. They see the flash. They hear the noise, and they pounce on it. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to cover a lot of water too, right? So it's sort of it's sort of a something out of a drift boat. It's not a, it's not a it's not a highly effective way to 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 for the weight angler to approach it, right? No, I mean you can. I, I see. I do see guys on low water fishing small streamers like wildy boogers and little tiny leeches. They're listening a totally different response than the people that are fishing sinking lines and six and seven weights out of drift boats. You know, they're, they're not getting the predatory response when they're swinging those little streamers. Um, they're getting a curiosity strike. Um, yeah, you're making, yeah, just the, making the, them mad. Um, yeah. Those big streamers are, they're pushing water. You know, the, the, the trout feel them in the lateral lines and, and yeah. you know, they attack. For sure. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I'm a fan. I, I, yeah. And you know, if you, if you're a, if you're a dry fly angler, you know, you know, it's all about that rise. It's about seeing the fish eat. Streamer fishing, I think, is is similar in a lot of ways. It's just yeah, like crosswalk not... fishing. Yeah, <laughs> you're seeing yeah, you're it not... happen. You know. Yeah, you're not gonna. You might not catch a lot, but you're gonna see fish roll on the fly. You're gonna see them attack it. You know, that's 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 some fun stuff. And it's a good way to catch a monster. I mean, for the longest time, the biggest fish I ever had anybody catch was on a streamer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that changed this fall. A fish ate a you know size eighteen pheasant tail um, <laughs> but it's a great way to target big fish cool and cool. it's fun i mean you know it is you just put on streamers relax and you know just get into a grind you're just doing the same thing chuck it in there strip it chuck it in there chuck it it's just it's relaxing to do that and if it's really cold it's a good way to stay warm too because you're sure. constantly in motion <laughs> 
Um, hey, uh, do we get any any questions uh, from from Drew? I don't know. I'm not seeing any right now. Uh, but if you have questions, you know, put them in the chat. Uh, got Brown here, so happy to answer them for you. Um, so uh, as far as um, you know, gear for streamer fishing. You mentioned heavier lines, sinking lines. What what do you sort of fish when you're when you're out there with a client that wants to you know torture himself all day with streamers? Um, you know, I've got, um, I've got different things. I like six weights. Um, you know, a lot of people, seven weights are probably more popular. I just like the six weights. Um, and you know, you've basically, we, we've got two different, um, or we've got two different sink tips that I like. Um, I don't use the full sinking lines on the river. It's just too much of a mess. Um, but you know, there's the, there's the, the depth charge, 30 foot, um, you know, shooting head type sink line, which I really love. It's easy to cast. You know, once you load the rod, one back cast, and boom, you can rocket it to your target. Um, it doesn't mend great, so it works better when, when you're fishing, you know, more laminar-type flow where you don't have to get it in there and mend it immediately and just get it in there and strip it off the bank. Um, I really like the bank shot with that little bit shorter uh, shorter tip, you know, when you're fishing those pockets right on the edge of the river. When you, like, throw them into an eddy, you want to pop two or three mends to, like, let the streamer hang it down there and try to get some attention. You know, a lot of times the fish will eat it as you're mending. That mending can twitch the fly a little bit. Um, and having more of your line floating is great for that. Um, and just run short leaders. You know, you don't need to put a nine-foot leader on a sink tip line. You know, um, most streamer fishermen keep a, a roll of, you know, 16-pound or 20-pound or, or, you know, maybe 12-pound, you know, 2 extra something like that. Um, but all you need is, like, three or four feet of fluorocarbon unless you're doing something crazy with some swimming heads you know you can get some of those big flat deer heads that need a little bit different leader but most flies three or four feet so that the sinking line can drag them down um because if you're fishing a nine foot leader you know your line could be six feet deep and your fly could still be on the surface um so make sure you're tight enough that you get it down the fish aren't going to see your sinking line yeah yeah totally I, and and having a short leader is almost more advantageous too, because it's going to pull that fly down into the strike zone faster, as opposed to a longer leader. That's going to, you know, your line's going to be down here and your leader is going to leave the fly up high. So Fortunately. definitely get that. Mm -hmm. um, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit to um, some of the conversation around, uh, you know, you, you know, you're a guide on the river, which means you're, you're approaching this with, with a drift boat every day. But um, for folks that may live near a tailwater that don't have a boat, um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, wade fishing tailwaters. Talked a little bit about the safety aspects of it. Um, but from a, from a tackle and technique standpoint, how, is that different? Does that, does that change from, from how you approach it from, from the boat? Well, um, yes. I mean, there are a lot of spots I can't get my boat in you know, without spooking fish, um, or, or maybe the ink rod is just too fast for me to anchor somewhere, but if you walked in, you could stand and nymph across. Um, so it can be very effective. Um, sometimes late in the summer, you just got to get your people out of the boat um, to, to switch it up and get to close and be stealthy. So it's, it's super effective. You know, the rocks are very slick, especially on the South Wilson. The rocks over the South are ridiculously slick. So, you know, a good rubber sole boot with studs, um, you know, I was wearing the, the, you know, the new pro boots with the Michelin studs and the, uh, the Michigan soles and those positive grip studs. It worked awesome. Um, that's, that's the best combo that I've found for waiting on those. It felt fine, but I think the rubber and stud combo, um, is by far the best. Um, you know, you need waders a lot of the time. The water's cold. We already talked about how cold, uh, you know, the water is year round. If you're going deeper than your knees, um, you're going to want white waders, maybe even in the summertime. Um, mm -hmm. you know, even even in August on the South Olson, I want waders if I'm going to be more than needy because it's, hot, it's cold. Um, you know, convertibles or the zips are great because it does, it is hot, you know. So you, you want to get your top down so that you can breathe a little bit but, but keep your legs from being frigid. Um, but rods rods and setups are all the same. I mean, everything everything works. You know, the, it's, it's, a, it's easier to Euronymph um, on foot. You can do it on a boat. Um, but it's, it's easier and I think it's more effective on foot. So that's a really nice technique that, that is better, especially if you're walking into a rapid or somewhere that's really fast and, and you can drive flies down seams really quickly. Um, and, and, you know, gotcha. just get to the spots the drift boats can. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, had a question come in. Um, what what's the optimal temperature? Um, got a, a, a someone on here who fishes the West Branch of the Delaware, another great Eastern tailwater. Um, you know, the water water temps start out in the 40s, gradually increase uh, to the 60s. The further down you go, so, so downstream. Um, you know, uh, wh wh what water temp do you want to sort of lock in at, or or does does your approach change as you go from you know that hyper cold water right up there by the dam to you know maybe eight or nine miles downstream where that where the sun's been on the water for a couple hours and um, you know talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I've not exactly thought about it like that, but what I'll say is we typically on the southwestern Watauga um, have more larger insects. Uh, the further you go downriver, um, you know, we have, we have bigger mayflies, the farther away from the dam you get. Um, we have, you know, more of the caddis flies. We do have a few stone flies. Um, so early in the year when you're seeing that like spring warm up that you're talking about, like getting into the sixties, you know, if everything's ideal, water flows and clarity are all good. I want to be on the lower part of the river. You know, I think when the water's getting warmer, you're getting fish, and, and I don't have the, a, a bell curve of fish metabolisms, but you should Google it if you want to see. I mean, you know, their metabolic activity follows that bell curve, and it's like somewhere from like, you know, 45 to 65 is, is you know, when you're going to get them feeding the most. Um, but that aside, whenever you get good bug, bug activity on a tailwater, the fish are going to be active. You know, even though it's spring, and I want to be down, down river where the sulfurs are hatching now, they'll hatch closer to the dam later. Um, and, and where the caddis are and, and saw some stoneflies hatching today. Um, we had it blow out because of rain a couple of days ago. It got too muddy to fish, and I went up to the dam. It's actually a nasty day, and I was only up there because it was, you know, the only place that was clear. Um, but it was rainy, and it was cold, even though it was the first of May, and blue-winged olives hatched. And, you know, if we had been down low and it had gotten rainy and nasty and cold, they probably wouldn't have hatched. The water would have been too warm. So, you know, it's not always – whatever's optimal is what's going to get the bugs bugs active. That's that's what I'm really looking for. And sometimes that might be closer to the dam where it's colder, and sometimes that might be further down. You know, come August, it's going to be tough down in the lower Watauga and lower South Wilson. Um, You know, maybe high rewards are some big fish that hang out there late in the year, but, you know, metabolic activity goes down as you get into the upper 60s. And, um, bug activity decreases. And so, you know, we typically will – as a rule, I bet everybody migrates upstream as water temperatures go up, trying to get colder and colder water as the summer goes on. Yeah, and, and generation can affect that too. So, you know, you get a pulse of water out of the dam. A lot of times it's not, it's not just on for hours at a time and off for hours at a time. You know, they could pulse it for an hour, or maybe two hours. That cold plug of water goes, it could trigger hatches all the way down the river. Yeah, um, for sure. Especially on the backside when the, when the, when the drop starts to happen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, a lot of times see that activity on the backside. And, you know, I remember, uh, days, uh, on these rivers, sun makes a difference too. You know, if you get into the, the lower river, I remember a really bright sunny day. Um, I think I was with you actually on either, I think it was on the Watauga. We got down to the low river, sun got low behind some hills um, and there was no longer any sun on the river and olives just started coming off like crazy. Yep. Um, so, so looking for those kind of cues is, um, or, or just noticing those kind of changes as the day progresses, whether it's generation air, um, yep. that all can affect the water temperature and, and trigger that. But, bubble. and that was like February or March. So like we had that, like it was that colder time of year when, you know, the bugs were seasonally appropriate for the water temperature, you know, if it had been, you know, those conditions in May, nothing might have because the sulfur yeah, is yeah. hot and sunny. Um, yeah. Come off. Yeah. So, yeah, and you it's, would, it's, a you tricky, know. it's a tricky dance. you got to pair up all these different conditions and try to make a guess. You know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I had never thought of that before because, you know, you see bright sun even in the winter, and it's kind of like, yeah, the olives might not happen today. Um, but then, you know, all it takes is a little bit of shade and they're, you know, yeah. they're, they're coming off. For sure. <laughs> um, so, so you brought up um, uh, Euronymphing. Um, uh, you know, it, it, as a productive way to fish tailwaters, um, you know, from a rigging perspective, uh, does it look different than a freestone? I mean, I know 
the, the we talked about uh, vegetation a little bit on these tailwaters. Um, you know, how does that work with a with a you know uh, like a, a check nymph that's gonna that's gonna be dragging the bottom? Um, anything anything to talk about there as far as rigging from a from a euro perspective for all the tight line guys out here? Um, not really. I mean, if you're fishing over, you know, I, I shy away from tight line nipping techniques when you're in. So the, the grass is gonna grow thickest in areas where the water's moving slower, right? And mm -hmm. and on the South Olson and Watauga, you have these nice flats. You know, maybe there'd be 400 yards of flat water between you know over the riffle above and the tail out below. Um, and that's where you've got the heaviest grass. As you get up into the riffles or even the rapids, you're not going to have as much grass. So it won't be as much a concern. Uh, I'm not saying you can't euro nymph in slow water. I just don't do it. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the heads of the pools. I'm looking for the faster current. I think that's where it's, you know, it's, it's the most advantageous um, to use that technique. And there you just don't have as much grass. Um, you know, whenever you're, you've got something on the bottom, though, we do have a bunch of didymo. Um, on the South Holston and the upper, upper South Holston, upper Watauga. And, uh, you know, every time your nymph hits the bottom, you're going to get goobered up in all of that. So you have to run your rig lighter if you're hitting bottom um, and catching that didymo. But, you know, no, you don't really, you don't really rig it any different. Um, you know, you're just going to have to dry dropper or dry fly or, you know, use some other type of suspension, leave the urine nymph behind to fish those slower grass beds. Because those, those fish stack into those grass beds. The grass beds are full of scuds and, and other nymphs and uh the fish will sit you know on top of the grass in the little sandy holes in, in the grass beds on the you know the grass will grow almost to the surface and on the other side the edge of it you might have an eight foot drop those fish will stack up on the sides um but it's moving really slow and, and so you've got to make a long slow presentation that's going to use some kind of suspension device indicator dry fly um you know whatever yeah, on low water, you mentioned using the yarn. You know yeah. that short leaf. That short leash can be really effective uh, on the edge of those uh, of those grass beds at that time. For sure. Cool. Um, so one other, I think the only other area we haven't talked about, which is sort of burgeoning right now, is the uh, the whole trout spay game. You're you're going down the river every day. Are you starting to see more guys on on these tailwaters with with the with the trout spay? Um. You know, we're seeing some. Um, it's definitely definitely getting more popular, and, and, it, and they work really well in our rivers. You know, the fish on both the Watauga and the South Holston respond really well to nymphs on the swing. Um, I, every day we get a fish, you know, more often unintentionally than intentionally, but uh, sometimes intentionally. <laughs> you know, we caught one today. The guy, like, I thought he just had the hook, and he was like, oh, my God. He's like, did y'all see that? And we were like, no. And he's like, I just went to cast and I had a fish on, you know, you'll go to like lift your flies at the end of your drift. And that little bit of movement, you know, will trigger the, the, the fish to strike. Um, you know, it's got to have to all these nymphs that are swimming around um, and trout space perfect for that. You know, you can, and you can cover a lot of water. You know, you can, there are riffles are big. Sometimes our riffles are, you know, 60, 70 feet across. It'd take you forever to run a dry dropper across them. You know, you can swing two wet flies, you know, unweighted nymphs across there, you know, much more efficiently and move down river and, and do really well. Yeah, especially in April when those when those cats start rolling too. Right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> and when the cats are out, everything, I mean, if you don't swing your flies when the cat is people moving, you're not going to get a bite. Even the dries, you got to skate the dries too. Um, so the trout space yeah. is great for that. Cool, cool. All, all good stuff, man. Um, well, anything uh, around these tailwaters that, that – we haven't talked about that that you think is is important for folks to know. Yeah, I mean, come check them out if you haven't done it. You know, you can get your fishing in August here. Um, you know, give us a call. We'd love to show you around or, or can point you in the right direction um, if you want to do it yourself. Um, they're only about 20 minutes away, and usually one or the other will have the conditions that you need for wading or floating. Um, you know, right now the South Holston's, you know, cut back to almost nothing some people are floating it you, you can you can do some low water floats in the in the slow deep stretches but you know traveling miles down the river is not happening for the most part um but that'll change and then next the watauga will have something wrong with it but the south holston you know will be in great shape so having the two side by side you know when you come here just keep an open mind you may want to fish the watauga but if it's not right 
just drive 20 minutes to the Holston or, or vice versa. They're both, you know, they're very similar rivers in, in many respects. Both have high fish numbers, both have good brown trout. Yeah, yeah, Un unbelievable, um, you know, size size and number of fish you can expect on these rivers. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and, and one other, uh, I guess, one other topic we could we could potentially broach, although it's, it's kind of a, a cult thing is the night fishing on these rivers. Um, done it a couple times. Um, you know, that's sort of a streamer thing, but there's like a whole class of brown trout that come out at night to eat, you know, anything they can, they can get their jaws around. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen pictures of gigantic brown trout. I mean, like, I don't know. I didn't see a tape on them, but like fish that looked maybe 40 inches, um, caught on streamers <laughs> and crankbaits at night. Yeah. Now, you know, we talked about streamers being hit and miss. They're even more hit and miss at night. Um, yes. But you can get some really big rewards. I've talked to the biologists, and they're like, these giant, giant brown trout are mostly feeding at night. Um, and, you know, it makes sense. Like, yeah, they get caught all during the day their whole lives. You know, eventually, <laughs> it's like white-tailed deer. They're going to learn to be nocturnal. You know, they're going to learn sure. it's safe to feed at night. Um, but, yeah, be careful out there. It's hard. <laughs> I've had some near near accidents in the dark. Uh, yeah, down yeah, river. but it's fun. And when it <laughs> and when it's dark out there, it's it's really really dark. <laughs> you can and miss it, it your needs to be out. Full moon is like not the right night. Like you need low light. Right. The, the moon, the full moon can turn them off. So yeah, yeah, like it needs to be dark, dark. Like can't see your hand in front of your face, dark. Which is, right. makes which makes everything a lot more interesting. But yep. yeah, we did it. We uh we did the South Holston a couple of years ago and, and one of my colleagues uh caught just an absolute behemoth. Um yeah. which was kind of fun to be around. So Oh yeah. Um had a question about that actually. Um fishing night this time is does it make a difference uh around time of year at night? You know, um that's interesting. I've never fished at night this time of year. Um we have so much bug activity going on during the day that um you know it doesn't it's not interesting me that much. It's more of a summer thing for me. I mean, I don't know. I just, I, summer's a nice time to be fishing at night, right? It's like nice temperature. Um, you know, there's not a lot of, oftentimes the bug activity is not as exciting during the daytime I and mean, you get great beetles and you get some sulfurs, you know, early through midsummer, but you know, um, I don't know. JC, go check it out. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> um, yeah. My yeah. I story. mean, I, it, because it, it does seem to be just an entirely different class of fish, I would imagine you find the right night, you know, the right moon phase. They're, these are apex predators in the system. You know, if, it, if, if it's a, you know, a waking articulated streamer that floats over their head, they're probably going to smash it, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, give it a try, but be safe doing it. Um, so, cool. Well, Brown, um, thanks so much for tonight. Uh, really great to see you. Uh, if if you uh, if you haven't fished these tailwaters, check them out. Uh, BrownTroutFlyFishing.com. Uh, he's he's got a great crew, um, five star rated on uh, on uh, Orvis all of our Orvis reviews, um, and a, and a really a great dude. Um, good friend of mine too. So yeah, really thanks, appreciate dude, it, Brown. Man. And I did. I just I was gonna. Uh give you like you know i found the first cicada shell in my backyard um this evening after um, getting home so uh, people are getting tuned up for that uh we hope it's going to happen on the south holston watauga looks like it will uh, but it's going to happen all over appalachia uh, indiana ohio kentucky tennessee um and uh, there's at least one in my backyard somewhere <laughs> <laughs> well that's that uh, when that bug happens uh you know <laughs> It can be absolutely nuts. I was talking to another colleague who, um, who's over by the in in the Knoxville area, and you know was catching rainbows and and with with cicadas. And you know when you pick it up out of the water, you can feel them like rolling around in your fingers, uh, in their belly. <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty cool. So I'm excited. Um, yeah. So book your trip now. It's time. Uh, probably what next week should should be a good time to to head out that way. I mean, this is a great time to come here anytime, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, we probably got another 10 days for good cicadas. I mean, it's been, it was 38 degrees last night. So soil temps 
you know, are slowly coming up. It'll be end of May, first of June, um, but could be sooner. I mean, people have been spotting them, you know, all over the Southern Appalachians for a week now in small numbers. But yeah, and don't don't count. It's not just trout either. Don't count off the carp, the smallmouth. I mean, everything eats them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I hope it happens, and if it does, I'll give you a shout if it does. I'll send you a text. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I'll be headed we'll your up. direction. <laughs> cool. Cool. All right. Um, all right. I think our time is up. Um, so uh, next week, join us for um, saltwater fly fishing fundamentals. The man uh, Tom Rosenbauer will be back, and joining him uh, will be Tuck Scott from Bay Street Outfitters. Um, so thanks, Brown. Good to see yeah, you, buddy. Thanks. You did a great job filling in for Mr. Trout. Uh, hey, I, I do it. what I can here. I can't, I can't, you know, claim to be any Tom Rosenbauer, but it was a <laughs> lot of fun. So good to see you, man. All right. See you, dude. We'll catch up soon. All right, man. Bye.